Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Gettysburg 159 and we are on Little Round Top, a place that needs little introduction, but I'm gonna do it nonetheless. I'm Gary Edelman, that's Chris White behind the camera there, that's his nod, and we've got a special guest with us as well today. But again, on this particular anniversary, we're trying to drill down to regiments and soldiers, and we're gonna do that again. So to get to that point, just know that on July 2nd, 1863, you've got Hood's Confederate Division attacking in this area, and it will be Law's Alabamians, one of the four brigades in that division, attacking Little Round Top, supported by elements of Robertson's Texas Brigade, Texans and Arkansans, okay? And they'll be attacking here. And as you well know, one particular Union Brigade gets rushed over to this side of the hill. We're on Vincent Spur, and that is named for Strong Vincent, uh, whose brigade comes and occupies this area. And I think you know that there are Michigan and uh, uh, New York and Pennsylvania and Maine troops defending this side of the hill. And to talk a little bit about these Alabama and Maine troops, let's go to Doug Ullman. Here's our, he's our friend, he's our historian, and you've seen him on a bunch of videos, Doug. <laughs> Hey, so um, what I really wanted to talk about here is the, the two conflicting or somewhat conflicting reports of the regimental commanders here. That's William C. Oates commanding the 15th Alabama and of course Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain commanding the 20th Maine. And a lot of ink has been spilled over this issue uh, in the years since the battle. Uh, so I thought I'd get down to some of the accounts that they wrote themselves, starting with Colonel Oates who writes, just as the 47th Alabama companies are being driven back, so that's his support off to his left, I ordered my regiment to change direction to the left, swing around, and drive the Federals from the Ledge of Rocks. The Ledge of Rocks he's referring to is this portion of the line on the left flank of the 20th Maine. You can see the left flank marker, and you can see how the, how the ground dips down this Ledge of Rocks here. Now, naturally, we have uh, Old Chamberlain Avenue in, in the background here, so the, maybe the topography is a little bit different than it was in 1863, but nevertheless, this is the area that Oates is going to try and drive the 20th Maine from. For the purpose of enfilading the line, we're leaving the 47th, he says. He wants, he's trying to gain the enemy's rear and drive him from the hill. He says, my men obeyed and advanced about halfway to the enemy's position, but the fire was so destructive that my line wavered like a man trying to walk against a strong wind, and then slowly, doggedly gave back a little. Then, with no one upon my left or right, no one upon the left or right of me, my regiment exposed, while the enemy was still under cover, so the cover of these large rocks and boulders, remember the, the walls that you see here were constructed after the battle, uh, still under cover, to stand there and die was sheer folly. Either to retreat or advance became necessity, for the carnage in the ranks was appalling. I again ordered the advance, and knowing the officers and men of that gallant old regiment, I felt sure they would follow their commander anywhere in the line of duty. I passed through the line, waving my sword, shouting, forward men to the ledge. Again, the ledge, this spot right around here and was promptly followed by the command in splendid style. We drove the Federals from their strong defensive position. Five times they rallied and charged us twice, coming so near that some of my men had to use the bayonet, but in vain was their effort. In other words, according to Oates, Oates says he not only uh, fought in this area, he actually pushed the, pushed the main men off of the ledge and drove them from the position and then was charged back not once but five times in this back and forth battle for this so-called ledge, the left flank of the, uh, the Union position here on Little Round Top. Now let's go to the other side, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He really needs no introduction um, and a lot of criticism is heaped on Chamberlain for in the aftermath of the, war, of the battle, he's going to deny a lot of what Oates claims that the Alabamians did and people will say, well, Chamberlain's just full of it because he obviously wasn't paying attention and why does he have all this attention anyway? But something we need to remember when we talk about this, this debate between Oates and Chamberlain is that while Oates is out here fighting the left flank of Chamberlain's regiment, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain is commanding the right wing of his regiment facing the other direction, almost behind where the camera is. So when he writes uh, home, he's, when, he's, when he remembers this battle, he doesn't really remember what's going on over here. It's chaos, it's smoke, it's, it's heavy fighting. He's not worried about this flank, he's worried about that flank. Major Ellis Spear is in charge of this left flank. So when Chamberlain writes after the battle, he's going to write home to his wife, Fanny. Well, he will say, uh, we are fighting gloriously, our loss is terrible, but we are beating the rebels as they have never been beaten before. The 20th has immortalized themself, itself. And we had the post of honor in the severe fight of the second on the extreme left where the enemy made a fierce attempt to turn the flank. 
My regiment was the extreme left and was attacked by a whole brigade. Just an example of how the fog of war really obscures what's happening here. He's not fighting a whole brigade. At most, he's fighting one, two regiments or parts of two regiments in this area. Uh, but to him, being, being uh, facing this whole, uh, this whole, I mean, these whole woods filled with Confederates seems to him like a whole brigade. Um, which, by the way, this is not an abnormal exaggeration. You read soldiers' accounts, they are often exaggerating the extent to which they are attacked. Some of these times they'll say they're fighting against a whole army when it's just a, com a company or a brigade. Um, so this is not unique to Chamberlain, and I feel uh, obliged to point that out. He says, we not only held our ground, but charged on the rebels and drove them out of all sight and sound and killing and wounding over 100 and taking 200 prisoners, including six officers, one the inspector general of the brigade. I received the thanks of my superior officers on the field after our charge, and this is important, after our charge, I was asked if my men could carry a high hill, that's big round top over to my left, which was a stronghold of the enemy being covered with large trees, with trees and large rocks. I point this out because um, you know, Chamberlain will famously receive the Congressional Medal of Honor, and part of that citation is not necessarily, not specifically for holding Little Round Top, but also for seizing Big Round Top in the background. Um, so Chamberlain often considers this as important as fighting here at, at Little Round Top, which I think sometimes gets overlooked. Uh, he says, I had lost at the time almost half the effective men I took in, but I went in with charged bayonets and line of battle and swept everything before us and taking many prisoners. He's not talking about the bayonet charge. He's talking about the charge up the big, up to the seize the height of Big Round Top, clearing out the remnants of the Alabama Brigade that had come over there in the fight earlier in the day. Uh, he goes on to describe the wounding. He says that the loss of Colonel Vincent was the greatest loss that could have befallen the brigade. Uh, and then my favorite line, he says to Fanny, I'm receiving all sorts of praise, but bear it meekly. Um, which I think is just, you know, <laughs> if, if you've been married long enough, you kind of know what that means to bear praise meekly. I wonder uh, if that's a sort of tongue-in-cheek comment that he's making there to Fanny. Um, in, 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 in summary, we have two very different battles fought here on Little Round Top. There is the battle fought by Colonel William C. Oates and his 15th Alabama as they are trying to gain this piece of ground, which they consider the key to the position. That if, they, if they were to get up on the ledge and hold it, they could unravel all of Vincent's brigade. And Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who is con primarily concerned once he's, once he's cleared the Alabamians from his immediate front with carrying out that order to seize Big Round Top, that higher hill even further up. Uh, even further up. Um, and we see this often as you read enough soldier accounts that these battles, when you drill down to the individual regiment or the company or even the individual soldier, um, you lose this. It, it's easy to see that one tiny piece of real estate becomes more important than the whole than the whole battle. And for the individual soldier, that's really what it comes to when we're talking about life and death on a battlefield. One last thing, um, I've you know. I've accepted the point at this point in my life that you know I would not have I would not be as interested in the Civil War had it not been the Get for the Gettysburg movie and for the Killer Angels and by extension the life of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, which is where I first started my major studies. And while I have certainly have not kept him on the pedestal that I had him on when I was 13, uh, I still remain a fan of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, even if I recognize some of his flaws. And so I think in talking about the battle at Gettysburg and the fighting at Little Round Top, that you know. Chamberlain exaggerates some of the things that he did here and elsewhere in the war. Um, it's because of this moment, this moment in his life is that is one of these turning points in his life as a, as a man. He realizes his full power and his full potential on this hill. Uh, and that's something that carries through for the rest of his life. It's something that you see borne out. It's why he keeps coming back to this place again and again and again to try and recapture that feeling that he must have felt of being fully alive in the chaos here on Little Round Top and what that meant to him as an individual. Great, great stuff, Doug. There's, there's a bunch of stuff in there that I really hadn't considered. And the main one is, is that I'm a Little Round Top guy. And I, uh, I don't think I've ever heard anybody discuss the dichotomy of how Oates is talking about what's going on here, and Chamberlain's going on, uh, talking about what's going on over there, and they argued in the post-war years, but they weren't even on the same part of the line. Really cool stuff, Doug. Secondly, I just want to close with, we're focusing on soldiers here, and 
Is it not a soldier's tendency to say that we did not fall back until we were alone, the supports on the right and left had fallen back, that we were facing superior odds? And I wonder, if you're honest with yourself, in any endeavor, especially as you get older and you tell stories from the past, if the odds weren't stacked just slightly greater against you than they really were, if your performance maybe doesn't improve with the years, think about that yourselves. Comment on whether or not uh, you'd ever thought about these two sort of separate fights for the round top from the com uh, commander's perspective. And, uh, let us know how else you're liking this approach because we have more uh, stuff coming up for Gettysburg 160 next year. What approach should we take next year? We'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Doug Ullman. Thanks, Chris White. Thank you all for watching and for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.